Hi, my name is Johnny Byer. I'm the director of the American Banjo Museum in Oklahoma City. Today, we've got quite a treat for you. We are going to be spending some time recounting the musical life of a banjo legend, Mr. Roger Sprung. He was a central figure in the folk music revival of the 1940s and 50s, a founder of the new grass or progressive bluegrass music, a revival, or how should I say, the movement of the 1960s and 70s, and of course, one of the man who, men who influenced guys like Tony Trishka and Bela Fleck and Steve Martin. Banjo icons today all look to Roger Sprung as being one of their guiding lights. And we are delighted to spend time with you today, Roger Sprung. Congratulations and welcome to the American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame. We're delighted to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you, Roger, obviously you have music in your heart. From your life's recollection, when did you know you had that music, that musical soul? Well, it came very gradual. When I was five years old, I, um, my parents had a nurse or a, uh, a maid, and she taught me how to play the piano with my knuckles on the black keys. And I played <laughs> the song. Then I went to the white keys myself and doodled. Before I know it, I had a, a couple songs that I put together and it kept expanding and expanding. And so from the piano, it came to a guitar for a couple of months and then it went on to a banjo when I was about 17 years old or 16 years old. If you had continued piano lessons, I know you tried a, a formal music training for a long time. How do you think, uh, if you had continued along that path, how do you think your life and musical career would be different? In one year, my parents gave me four piano teachers. And one was a cousin and so forth. And she got married. The other one was a counselor at a camp. And he moved on and two others and, uh, and I didn't learn much because I don't read. And I don't think if I'm right, I hope I'm right, I think I'm right, that most of the bluegrass players don't read music. Mm -hmm. Even though Earl Scruggs has a book out and uh, Bill Keith wrote the book I, and uh, both people don't. But I, uh, I just continued on and I, my grandfather had a pork chop and I got a guitar. I played that for three months and then I played banjo for, for the rest of my life. And that really hooked me on real good. Uh, most of us who know New York City, we know it from right now or recent years. Tell us about the, the vibe you experienced and how the musical scene was in New York City as you were uh, coming of musical age. I have a brother that's four years older than I am. He, for years, while I was learning the piano, playing piano, I played boogie woogie on the piano. Uh, he said, you ought to come down to Washington Square in New York City. It's a, the south, the southern part of Fifth Avenue. And uh, there's a lot of people playing folk songs down there. You ought to come down and listen. So I went down with some friends of mine down to Washington Square, and I saw people of all ages playing all kinds of stringed instruments and things. And I said, that's for me. Pete Seeger lived about a block away from Washington Square at the time. And he came down a couple of times and uh, it influenced me. And I had a lot of friends that played and it was just fun. And I play all kinds of songs. Uh, happy birthday coming around the mountain. And uh, I spread out from folk songs. I really love folk songs. I still do. And uh, I just branched out and I played a lot of songs that I enjoyed. Even though the music that you were playing down in Washington Square and the way everyone was dressed seems very genteel by today's standards, I'm wondering, was folk music thought of as being kind of counterculture at the time? Uh, the, the, not really. There was a man down there, George Margolin, who played by himself. 
on the guitar and uh, and it just grew bigger and bigger and people started to form little groups around the fountain but we all played and we get to know each other much better in fact the person that i play with on many of my records hal wiley was a, a trooper of mine he and i played a lot of uh, together we formed the band there wasn't too much folk music except washington square when the folk boom became mainstream a lot of the artists used their music to uh, push maybe political or social agendas that were on their minds. Did you ever use your music in that way? People always wanted me to play political songs. Uh, Pete Seeker came down, he played some, and other people played some. And for a while, you had to be in politics. But I never put my music delved around politics that much. I like the old songs. I mean, and I mean old songs, old, old songs. I like the best. And I went down the mountains for 60 years or so looking for songs from the mountains and uh, meeting people who were farmers who, who played, some of them played. For instance, I went down to Spring Valley in North Carolina and uh, there was a man, I like to tell this story a lot. There was a, a sort of a, a, a candy store in the middle of a cornfield. And I bought some candy, which was old. I threw it away. But the man, there was a man on the porch of this little shop and he was chewing a, uh, a weed. I said, how do you like it around here? He says, oh, I love it. I said, where, where do you live? He says, well, I came from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> came down here, and this is where I love to be. You know, and from the store, I found out where a person played, and I went, and there was quite a story, and I went to the person's where he, he lived, and, uh, I was told that when I saw him, he'd be chopping down a tree. So when, when I went down the road and I went to buy roads and I see this man chopping down a tree. It must have been a half hour later. And I said, uh, I'm looking for this man. They said, I'm the man. And uh, you play banjo? He said, yes. Yeah. So I went into his home, which was about, oh, an eighth of a mile away. And he played for me, and he was he was all right, and he just doodled a little. But what I enjoyed about it much, the, the most, is as I left, as I got to the door to leave, his mother was there. He lived with his mother, and his mother started to sing old folk songs. So the second I turned the knob to leave, I left the knob, I turned around, went back in and listened to an afternoon of folk songs, which I loved. And I, I put them on the banjo and I played. And that was, it happened, oh, 10 or 15 times when I was down south. And I enjoyed, and that's where I got my songs from. Speaking of songs, uh, one of the songs that uh, you're associated with is of course a song that became a great hit for the Kingston Trio, Tom Dooley. Your band introduced that song. Tell us how that happened. Well, I had a trio and we went out to Long Island. Frank Warner, he was, he was singing Tom Dooley. So uh, I said, I like the song. And so uh, I got the words and uh, I recorded it. And uh, that's how it came to be about, that I played it a few times and then it was grabbed by the Kingston Trio and a few other people. It was uh, a lot of fun. Your early inspirations seemed to all be old time or claw hammer players. When did you get enamored by bluegrass? I went to a man's house, Billy Fair. 
And uh, he said, you ought to look up this guy, Earl Scruggs. He says, go to 52nd Street. There's a lady there who sings country music. She owns the place, Rosalie Allen. So I went up to Rosalie Allen. She showed me, showed me this record, uh, 78, by Earl Scruggs doing the Foggy Mountain Breakdown. So uh, I bought it and I loved it and I started to learn it. And then uh, I bought a few more records by Earl Scruggs and that started my style of playing, which people tell me is it's like Earl Scruggs, but it's not the same same feeling that I that uh, that he that he has. So you really were self-taught in terms of teaching yourself the Scrugg style of playing. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Billy Fair showed me how to play how Scruggs played with two fingers, and that was wrong. And I had uh, Tom Paley, who is now in England. Um, he played he played it all kinds of hard picky pick offs and hammers, which could be done without doing pick-offs and hammers. He showed me uh, his way of doing it for about three lessons. And uh, then I put them all together and, and recorded them. New York, of course, is considered a real uh, center of urban sophistication. How did New Yorkers respond to bluegrass when you introduced that style in the city? I went to Washington Square every Sunday while it was uh, weather permitted. And the crowd got bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, people liked it. Uh, a man there who played four string banjo gave my name to K Star, who comes from Oklahoma. So I went on tour with K Star. And we went down to the Diplomat Hotel in Florida. And we went to the Roosevelt in New Orleans went to a few, a few places. Uh, the Persian Room in, in uh, the Hotel Essex in New York it was a lot of fun. It got bigger and bigger. You've tried to keep a different identity between folk music and bluegrass music and didn't want to be known as one or the other. And you've come up with a style all your own, right? Yes, you could take any song and and make it bluegrass. It's Actually, what makes it bluegrass is the banjo style. If I take my style to claw hammer, which I do, it's not bluegrass anymore. There are many styles of playing the, the, the five string and uh, it's fun. Now you've been uh, called the four string banjo players favorite five string banjoist. Why do you think that is? Oh, I do play four string banjo numbers on my Smithsonian Folkways uh, albums, I play uh, a couple of uh, four string songs. Bye Bye Blues, The World Is Waiting For The Sunrise. There's a lot of songs, you just play them. If you play bluegrass, all it's bluegrass. If you claw hammer it or frailing or whatever you want to call it, it's old timey, mm -hmm. but not really an old time song. Now you've been, Performing for what seventy years? Uh, performing since nineteen fifty, I guess. But I've been playing since nineteen forty-seven or forty-six. I did mechanical engineering, and uh, and and at night I I played the banjo. And finally, I decided that I could make more money playing the banjo, teaching, and playing than being a mechanic. And so I did that I did. You know, music is a profession that is really fraught with setbacks and some of those setbacks are uh, offset by really great events, triumphs in your lives. Uh, did you have any setback that turned out to be uh, something that pushed you forward? No. <laughs> Put it that way. Anything that came by that I could do, I could do. There wasn't any setback at all. Let's put it that way. Everything well, I did. 
was was nice and I learned from them all. Well, how, how about triumphs? What's what's your proudest moment? One was world's champion at the Union Grove North Carolina Festival. Was it was really nice, was nice, and also playing at the Persian Room with K Star. You know, no matter where you go and play, you always get an experience that you'll remember, such as I was playing in the Persian Room of uh, New York City at the Essex House that's on 57th Street and 5th Avenue. And uh, I was with K Star. We were walking around, she and I, walking around different tables while she was singing the Wabash Cannonball. And what she did is she stopped at the table, tables, and she asked somebody at the table, you want to blow the whistle like the train? So she had a little whistle with her. She gave it to people and they would blow and it sound like a train. Then she went to this table. She says, I'm from something like Ty Ty, Oklahoma. Uh, I, I think that was it. And uh, everybody applauded. And then everybody stopped for, after applauding, except one person. They kept applauding. And she said, how come you're still applauding? He says, I'm from Secaucus, New Jersey. Now, Secaucus, New Jersey was a place where they had slaughterhouses. And that's where he came from. So he kept applauding. He must have been two sheets to the wind or something. <laughs> and uh, we all laughed. We all laughed. It was, it was a funny moment in a very classy place, the Persian Room. Now, you've made some of your best music with some of the greatest musicians in the acoustic world. Uh, tell us about some of your favorite musical collaborators over the years. Uh, who did that Cat in the Cradle? Uh, Harry? Chapin. Harry Chapin. Chapin. Harry Chapin, yep. Yeah, he was a pupil of mine. And uh, he took lessons. And uh, one day I met his brother. And uh, he reminded me of it, and it was real nice that, to know that I, I didn't know he was a big man at the time. I just gave him lessons. It was, actually, he was a boy, and uh, it was it was it was it was quite nice to know that he made it big. Eric Darling gave a few lessons to him, and uh, and a lot of people. Got. Uh, I was watching a review a few a half an hour ago. I I must have influenced a lot of people because I'm getting thanks from cards from everybody for doing what I do. It's really nice. Well, you have influenced an awful lot of people over the years, and uh, I hope it's gratifying to see that uh, they give you the credit that you deserve. Wonderful. In fact, half of them I don't even know. <laughs> Did they watch me? Uh, Pete Seeger down Washington Square watched my fingers and see that he played Scrug style in his way, like we all do. And uh, he thanked me. And uh, people watch all over. I mean, this award was, I mean, I don't know how I got it, but it's here. And um it's very nice that I can influence so many people. I still give lessons. I still give lessons. And uh, people love it. Um, uh, they gave me a birthday. It's my birthday, by the way. Wow. Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I won't tell you how old I am. Well, we can do the math. <laughs> you were born in 1930. <laughs> 90? Are you 90 today? What? 90 years. Happy, happy birthday. Thank you. It's unbelievable. But, but uh, let, me, let me ask you this. 
you've had a long, you know, already had a long life and career, influenced a lot of people and taught a lot of people. Do you have something rolling around in your head that you want to accomplish yet musically, new ideas or concepts? Uh, no, not, not anymore. I had a couple of, of afflictions with my body. So I can't, I can't play as well as I do, used mm -hmm. to. But uh, uh, there's always something that, that I could w try to work out, but not anymore, at least not for a while. Before we say goodbye and happy birthday one more time, I have one more question. What you if, got? You, if you could go back and give a younger version of Roger Sprung one bit of career advice, what would that be? It could be a career, but it shouldn't be a career because it should be an advocation on a sideline. I wouldn't make it a career, but it's playing a banjo is real enjoyment. And K Star says it. It's hard to play a sad song on a banjo. So, I mean, it has given me a lot of comfort and happiness to play. If you play it, you could, you could do your, your own thing in it. You can, uh, you can change. You don't have to read music. You can say, I could change that. So it sounds like this and do it on the ends and make it a sound beautiful on the instrument. It's not an instrument that you have to stick to one, one thing and just do what it says. You can put your heart in it, let's put it that way. Well, the banjo and the banjo is joyful. You've put your heart in it all your life and you've really made a lot of people happy and made their musical life different because of it. Roger Sprung, thank you very much. Welcome to a well-deserved induction into the American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame. Well, thank you very much for the whole business. And Great. happy birthday one more time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.